Hi everyone, it's Sonia here. So I wanted to talk to you about what's been going on in Quebec. Everybody's talking about Ottawa, which of course is important, but there's a lot of stuff going on over here too. So that's what I want to share with you. What happened with the convoy that went to Quebec? What's going on with Quebec's deconfinement plan or abolition of the uh, the measures that have been in place? And why what's happening here is driven much more by politics than by actual science. Oh, before I start, I just want to say thanks for liking the video. Thank you for your support on Patreon. That keeps my channel going. Also, I still have a link for the C60 EVO. C60 is a powerful antioxidant that helps your body produce more of its own glutathione and other detoxifiers. Personally, I found it to be extremely helpful to me for my sleep. It has really improved my sleep quality a lot. So I'm a really big fan and my testimonial is actually up on their website. So I want to let you know about it. And if you're interested, please click the link below. And if you order through the link using my code, you get a discount. So please check it out. So the weird thing is that while in other areas of Canada, the things seem to be shifting. Our, our government here it seems to like just want to remain entrenched. So let's look a little bit about what's going on and what might be behind uh, their their approach to this situation. So, uh, you know, everyone uh, from uh, Dr. Kieran Moore in Ontario uh, saying that the vaccine passport needs to be reviewed since it doesn't prevent transmission in, of infection to uh, Dr. Tam saying Canada needs a more sustainable approach, also recognizing that the current vaccines don't protect against Omicron, um, to even also Alberta and Saskatchewan ditching the measures, ditching the passport. Ontario also uh, Doug Ford was just recently caught on a hidden camera, hidden microphone, saying that Ontario is going to get rid of the passport as well very soon. Miracle of miracles under extreme pressure from the opposition. Quebec government is actually weighing suspending the vaccine passport until the next wave. So they're considering that it might be possible to suspend it, but they will not get rid of it. They would plan to revive it in the fall uh, or assuming whenever we have another wave. So this is what I'm talking about. Whatever they do, they want to have things in place to make sure that they retain a certain amount of power they have gained during the pandemic. The government might be sort of um, preparing the way to, uh, to change the laws to, to give them the ability to keep some of the power they got under this emergency to sort of like entrench the emergency powers in the law. Legault had said that on the 14th of March, most of the sanitary measures would be lifted. But he didn't say that they would remove the declaration of a state of emergency. So when questioned on that at a press conference, they said that they were working on a bill to remove the state of emergency in March, but allow a kind of framework of measures which would remain in place long term. They're kind of already anticipating that there'll be a new variant in the fall, and then they're, they're going to bring it all back. Oh, there's so much sneaky stuff going on here, though, let me tell you. I'm going to come back to why I think the government is holding on to their power, uh, some of the reasons. But let's just see some of the information that the government actually has right now. It's turning out now. They're discovering that we had 2 million cases of COVID just in this last wave, which was like December through January. 2 million out of a population of 8.5 million. So like roughly one quarter of Quebecers were infected with COVID in this last wave. Anyway, um, that may, that, my mind is just blown. That, that was a lot of COVID. Recently at a press conference, a journalist brought up the, the question of the third dose. Our government had been saying even up till very recently, by March, your vaccine passport won't be valid without the third dose. And they had been telling the public, contrary to the advice of the medical establishment, that everyone needs to go and get their third dose, even if they have had COVID. Um, or suspect that they've had it, and to not even wait the, the recommended period of two to three months, but to just go get it right away as soon as their symptoms were over. Um, a lot of people are saying this sounded more like a politically motivated policy than a public health motivated policy. But it was brought up again at this, uh, this conference here with Dr. Luc Boileau, who's our new director of public health. And the journalist had mentioned that the Quebec Immunization Committee was saying that it's not as pointless, actually, for people who've had COVID to get the third dose 
it'd be better to wait uh, till later till the next vaccine formula comes out which would be adapted hopefully to whatever else is out there Et lui suggère d'attendre le nouveau vaccin étant celui pouvant protéger contre des variants comme Omicron. La présidente du cycle, c'est le docteur Caroline Quash. C'est juste que vous dites, c'est inutile, vous êtes déjà protégé. Exact, c'est inutile, on est très bien protégé. En fait, l'infection protège de façon beaucoup plus large bon. qu'une dose de vaccin. Et ouais. habituellement, la protection suite à l'infection euh, dure plus longtemps qu'une dose de vaccin. Donc, tout ça mis ensemble, il y a aucun bénéfice direct à aller chercher une troisième dose quand on vient de faire la COVID. Bon, là, je pense c'est clair, clair, clair. Très bien. So, you heard it yourself uh, from the Quebec Council on Immunization. They said there is no benefit to someone who's had COVID recently in this wave to go get a third dose. And uh, so our government knows that. And um, I have more evidence here of what they know. This was a directive issued by the Minister of Health and Social Services, which is Christian Dubé, who had been pushing for people to go get that third dose. But look at what he says here in this directive concerning the healthcare workers. Sorry, it's in French. I'll translate. Okay, so he says that they have changed um, the classifications. There's no longer a category of adequately protected. The categories now are as follows. Ca uh, health workers who are considered protected, not including immunocompromised, are those who have had a previous COVID infection confirmed with the TAAN, the test, I guess a PCR test, since the 20th of December 2021, whether they're vaccinated or not. That's right. Our health minister... <laughs> It says that if, even if you're not vaccinated, if you had COVID in this last wave, you're considered protected. These following health care workers are considered partially protected. Anyone who's had three doses of the vaccine, anyone who's had at least two doses uh, since more than seven days of the second dose, one dose of Johnson & Johnson, or who had a COVID infection before the 20th of December, or who had a COVID infection and then uh, more than six months ago, but then was vaccinated. And they, t they say the, the timeline. So the government knows that unvaccinated people who've had COVID in the last wave are considered protected. And vaccinated people who have not had COVID in the last wave are considered partially protected. And yet the policy continues to be that to work in the hospital or to visit or to visit in a care home, you, you have to show your vaccine passport. What does this passport actually prove right now? It just proves that you've received the vaccination. It, it would maybe prove that you're partially protected. It doesn't prove anything more than that. And uh, as Lara has discovered working in the hospital, a lot of vaccinated staff came down with COVID and had to go on leave in this last wave. And uh, moreover, a lot of people who came in with their vaccine passport brought COVID in uh, to, the, to the wards and then it spread among the patients and the staff. Lara has seen this herself personally many times. So, so this is quite mind-blowing that the Minister of Health uh, knows this and yet the policy isn't changing. Why? Seems like it's something that they just want to keep uh, keep going, regardless of whether it really serves a purpose for public health right now. Now, here's another thing. Um, see, once they end the state of health emergency, within three months, they have to table in the National Assembly an event report. And the report has to specify the nature, uh, the cause of the threat, the duration of application of the declaration, as well as, an in as the intervention measures implemented and the powers exercised under Article 123. So once they end it, they've got three months, 90 days, to produce this report and give it to the National Assembly. And if you go and look at Article 20, 123, you're going to see this is the part that details all these exceptional powers they have during the state of emergency, which include compulsory vaccinations, uh, closing places, uh, closing access to places to part of the population or all uh, making people have to present ID or otherwise, you know, papers, please, all these kind of things. And it also 
gave them the right to make purchases without going through the usual process of putting out a notice to tenders and then uh, going through the, the bidding process, which I don't completely understand. But the bottom line was the government could just award contracts to whoever they wanted without any oversight from anywhere else. So once this uh, emergency uh, declaration is ended, they have to account for all these things and produce this report for everything, including who they hired for all these contracts. And here's just for an example, one of the contracts they must have given, vaccination passport verification terminals manufactured in Baycomo. So they have this company making these things, which cost $2,000 each. And it's supposed to be so you don't have to use a phone to check the QR code. So these little terminals here, which would then be uh, put everywhere conveniently, actually, now that I come to think of it, if, if once all this is uh, combined, like once we move to digital ID, which is on the agenda for 2025 here, actually, um, you know, it could be possible that if you're entering somewhere where you're not supposed to be, then your stuff isn't going to function. I mean, it's possible. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's it's automated. So they'd have these little things there and then the person working would just have to verify the person's identification but just for example like they did a lot of this kind of stuff lots of contracts so the thing about having to make these accounts is that they have to do it 90 days from when the emergency ends so if they're going to end it around the 14th of march they must table this report in the national assembly within three months so the national assembly sits for the last time on june 10th so you can do the math if they end the emergency uh, March 14th and they've got 90 days to submit this report and, and table in the National Assembly. Well, it's going to happen right when the National Assembly is no longer sitting. And then they won't sit again until November, which would be after the election, which is going to take place in October. So it looks like a very clever way for them to make sure that none of this information gets out. It's not discussed in the National Assembly. They're not really going to be held to account. They're not going to be scrutinized. The public's not going to know. There won't be any controversy to interfere with their election campaign. That's why, especially, it really looks like a lot of this is just purely for political motives. So they're thinking they can put this off till March 14th. Well, that's what they're doing. They won't have to submit their report until basically the National Assembly is no longer in session. And then they're free to go do their election campaign with nobody knowing what happened. They're hoping to hold on to their supporters to, to recapture, again, uh, the election. And then <laughs> the National Assembly may be sitting in November. But by that time, these new laws will be in place, giving the government the power to reimpose all these measures without even having to declare a state of emergency. So uh, it looks like uh, they're using some very sneaky measures here. It's quite scary, obviously. And meanwhile, of course, also trying to make sure they secure their power. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what happened with the convoy to Quebec. They went up there. It was very peaceful. It happened during the same time as the carnival. There weren't any incidents. They were there for about three days and then they left. But they said they'd be back. They'd be back in two weeks at the end of the carnival. I had heard that there had been some discussion with the government. A... It, you know, right after they did their convoy to Quebec, that's when the government said they were going to start rolling back all these measures they had had, like the capacity limits and the closures and all this kind of stuff. Well, we don't know if it had anything to do with the convoy. But whatever they rolled back, it's not satisfactory to the convoy organizers because they want the declaration of emergency ended and they want the vaccine passport to be discontinued. So... What happened, though, um, after they left, as it says here, can organizers confide. So this here on the left is Rambo, and this is Big. This is Bernard Gauthier, also known as Rambo. This is Kevin Big Grenier. So what they confided was that while they were there, people came up to them saying that they were you know, ready to kill. There were a number of people. Uh, Kevin Big Grenier said not just one or two there were 10 people who told me we're almost there but thank you you give us hope so he's saying what are you waiting for drama to happen uh, people are saying I'm ready to take up arms and go to parliament he was telling them you know basically like chill out 
We're going to, we're going to sort this out intelligently. Um, I'm actually not surprised. I, I, I was actually kind of surprised that there hadn't been any acts of violence this entire time because I know how aggravated people are around here. And you know what they say about Canadians. They're the nicest people in the world, except for the French ones. No offense to the French ones, but they're not as pathologically nice as the rest of Canada. So I was kind of wondering if people were just going to blow up, you know, or blow something up. Uh, so this was brought up, you know, by the members of the opposition parties. They they all said, basically just said to Legault, you need to take this seriously and that it's it's his responsibility to keep the peace. The government's responsibility to maintain social peace. Elected officials are targeted by death threats and hateful messages. I'd say that is very serious. So what did Legault do? He criticizes the opposition parties. How dare you tell me that I've done anything wrong? He criticized the opposition, accusing opposition parties of condoning the threats of armed violence. So that, that's not what happened. They didn't, they didn't at all condone it. They condemned it. But they said you have to take it seriously and you've got to work to, you know, work with the public. You've got to maintain the peace. But yeah, pretty much all the opposition parties had something to say about it. And Legault, as usual, just sort of deflected it and turned it into some other kind of um, propaganda operation. I, I was kind of wondering how, how, how Legault and Dubé even walk around. And, like, how do they even leave the house anymore and walk around in public? Are they scared? Do, do they have extra security? Uh, maybe they should get themselves like a little plastic bubble like the Pope when he came in. The, maybe the Pope mobile. If it's, not, if it's not being used, maybe they should bring the Pope Mobile over here. And then when, when Francois Legault wants to go out in public, he can just sit in the Pope Mobile for his own safety. But, I mean, basically, that's uh, the gist of it. It's, it's really hit a boiling point here in Quebec. Although things kind of went peacefully for the demonstration, it's not over. They're coming back in two weeks with reinforcements. And um, the government here, all the opposition parties, they all know what Legault is doing. The media is talking about it openly, going against public health advice, using this for political purposes. It's like everybody knows, and yet somehow a lot of people don't know. And they, they're still going to vote for Legault in the fall. But if anyone knows what he's doing here, setting up this dictatorship, basically absolutely setting up a, a Chinese-style social credit system. I guess we're like the testing ground for the rest of Canada. So the, the passport right now, since it doesn't uh, prevent transmission of infection, it's, it's social credit passport because it, it just shows that you've complied. And for that, you get privileges. You get to go to Costco. That's what he's doing here. So uh, the convoy, uh, people know, a lot of people know, the government certainly knows. But I mean, I don't even understand how he's gotten away with all this for so long. Even the media is starting to call him out on it. And then, and then they somehow expect that he'll still win the election in October. God help us. Anyhow, I just wanted to give you the update on what's been happening up here. I think it's, it's a pretty big deal. Well, that's it. Thanks uh, for liking the video. And thanks again for your support on Patreon. It keeps my channel going. And thanks for checking out the link for C60 EVO, my favorite antioxidant. That really helped me a lot with my sleep. And uh, thanks for listening to me. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.